Welcome to SnoozeCast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on social media and wherever you listen to podcasts. Our current goal is to get to 100 written reviews on the podcast app to help new listeners find us. If you haven't subscribed and written a review yet, please do. We get closer to our goal every week. Your reviews continue to amaze us, and we learn from your feedback as well. So thank you for taking the time to share. This episode is brought to you by Floppy-Eared Rabbits. Tonight, we'll be reading Tales of Peter Rabbit and Friends from The Great Big Treasury of Beatrix Potter, written by Beatrix Potter. The Tales of Peter Rabbit was first published in 1902, when she was in her 30s. Potter was an English writer, illustrator, natural scientist, and conservationist, best known for her children's books featuring animals. Though Potter was typical of women of her generation in having limited opportunities for higher education, her study and watercolors of fungi led to her being widely respected in the field of mycology. In all, Potter wrote 30 books, the best known being her 23 children's tales. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. The Tale of Peter Rabbit Once upon a time, there were four little rabbits, and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sandbank underneath the root of a very big fir tree. Now, my dears, said old Mrs. Rabbit one morning, you may go into the fields or down the lane, but don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. Your father had an accident there. He was put in a pie by Mrs. McGregor. Now run along, and don't get into mischief. I am going out. Then old Mrs. Rabbit took a basket and her umbrella and went through the wood to the baker's. She bought a loaf of brown bread and five currant buns. Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, who were good little bunnies, went down the lane to gather blackberries But Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. First, he ate some lettuces and some French beans, and then he ate some radishes. And then, feeling rather sick, he went to look for some parsley. But round the end of a cucumber frame, whom should he meet? But Mr. McGregor, Mr. McGregor was on his hands and knees planting out young cabbages, but he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling out, Stop thief! Peter was most dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. He lost one of his shoes among the cabbages and the other shoe amongst the potatoes. After losing them, he ran on four legs and went faster, so that I think he might have gotten away altogether if he had not unfortunately run into a gooseberry net and got caught by the large buttons on his jacket. It was a blue jacket with brass buttons, quite new. Peter gave himself up for lost 
and shed big tears. But his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows, who flew to him in great excitement and implored him to exert himself. Mr. McGregor came up with a sieve, which he intended to pop upon the top of Peter. But Peter wriggled out just in time, leaving his jacket behind him, and rushed into the tool shed and jumped into a can. It would have been a beautiful thing to hide in if it had not had so much water in it. Mr. McGregor was quite sure that Peter was somewhere in the tool shed, perhaps hidden beneath a flower pot. He began to turn them over carefully, looking under each. Presently, Peter sneezed. Kerchoo! Mr. McGregor was after him in no time and tried to put his foot upon Peter who jumped out of a window, upsetting three plants. The window was too small for Mr. McGregor, and he was tired of running after Peter. He went back to his work. Peter sat down to rest. He was out of breath and trembling with fright, and he had not the least idea which way to go. Also, he was very damp with sitting in that can. After a time, he began to wander about, going lippity, lippity, not very fast, and looking all around. He found a door in a wall, but it was locked, and there was no room for a fat little rabbit to squeeze underneath. An old mouse was running in and out over the stone doorstep, carrying peas and beans to her family in the wood. Peter asked her the way to the gate, but she had such a large pea in her mouth that she could not answer. She only shook her head at him. Peter began to cry. Then he tried to find his way straight across the garden but he became more and more puzzled. Presently, he came to a pond where Mr. McGregor filled his water cans. A white cat was staring at some goldfish. She sat very, very still, but now and then the tip of her tail twitched as if it were alive. Peter thought it best to go away without speaking to her. He has heard about cats from his cousin, little Benjamin Bunny. He went back towards the tool shed, but suddenly, quite close to him, he heard the noise of a hoe. Scritch, scratch, scratch, scritch. Peter scuttered underneath the bushes, but presently... As nothing happened, he came out and climbed upon a wheelbarrow and peeped over. The first thing he saw was Mr. McGregor hoeing onions. His back was turned towards Peter, and beyond him was the gate. Peter got down very quietly off the wheelbarrow and started running as fast as he could along a straight walk behind some black currant bushes. Mr. McGregor caught sight of him at the corner, but Peter did not care. He slipped underneath the gate and was safe at last in the wood outside the garden. Mr. McGregor hung up the little jacket and the shoes for a scarecrow to frighten the blackbirds. Peter never stopped running or looked behind him till he got home to the big fir tree. He was so tired that he flopped down upon the nice soft sand 
on the floor of the rabbit hole and shut his eyes. His mother was busy cooking. She wondered what he had done with his clothes. It was the second little jacket and pair of shoes that Peter had lost in a fortnight. I am sorry to say that Peter was not very well during the evening. His mother put him to bed and made some chamomile tea, and she gave a dose of it to Peter. One tablespoon to be taken at bedtime. But Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail had bread and milk and blackberries for supper. The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin This is a tale about a tale. A tale that belonged to a little red squirrel, and his name was Nutkin. He had a brother called Twinkleberry, and a great many cousins. They lived in a wood at the edge of a lake. In the middle of the lake, there is an island covered with trees and nut bushes. And amongst those trees stands a hollow oak tree, which is the house of an owl who is called Old Brown. One autumn, when the nuts were ripe and the leaves on the hazel bushes were golden and green, Nutkin and Twinkleberry and all the other little squirrels came out of the wood and down to the edge of the lake. They made little rafts out of twigs, and they paddled away over the water to Owl Island to gather nuts. Each squirrel had a little sack and a large oar and spread out his tail for a sail. They also took with them an offering of three fat mice as a present for Old Brown and put them down upon his doorstep. Then Twinkleberry and the other little squirrels each made a low bow and said politely, Old Mr. Brown, will you favor us with permission to gather nuts upon your island? But Nutkin was excessively impertinent in his manners. He bobbed up and down like a little red cherry, singing, Riddle me, riddle me, rot tot tot a little wee man in a red, red coat, a staff in his hand and a stone in his throat. If you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a groat. Now... This riddle is as old as the hills. Mr. Brown paid no attention whatever to Nutkin. He shut his eyes obstinately and went to sleep. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts and sailed away home in the evening. But next morning, they all came back again to Owl Island, and Twinkleberry and the others brought a fine, fat mole and laid it on the stone in front of Old Brown's doorway and said, Mr. Brown, will you favor us with your gracious permission to gather some more nuts? But Nutkin, who had no respect, began to dance up and down tickling old Mr. Brown with a nettle and singing, Old Mr. B, riddle me re, hitty pitty within the wall, hitty pitty without the wall. If you touch hitty pitty, hitty pitty will bite you. Mr. Brown woke up suddenly and carried the mole into his house. He shut the door in Nutkin's face. Presently, a little thread of blue smoke from a wood fire came up from the top of the tree, and Nutkin peeped through the keyhole and sang, A house full, 
a hole full, and you cannot gather a bowl full. The squirrels searched for nuts all over the island and filled their little sacks. But Nutkin gathered oak apples, yellow and scarlet, and sat upon a beech stump playing marbles and watching the door of old Mr. Brown. On the third day, the squirrels got up very early and went fishing. They caught seven fat minnows as a present for old Mr. Brown. They paddled over the lake and landed over a crooked chestnut tree on Owl Island. Twinkleberry and six other little squirrels each carried a fat minnow. But Nutkin, who had no nice manners, brought no present at all. He ran in front, singing, The man in the wilderness said to me, How many strawberries grow in the sea? I answered him, as I thought good, As many red herrings as grow in the wood. But old Mr. Brown took no interest in riddles, Not even when the answer was provided for him. On the fourth day, the squirrels brought a present of six fat beetles, which were as good as plums in plum pudding for old brown. Each beetle was wrapped up carefully in a dock leaf, fastened with a pine needle pin. But Nutkin sang as rudely as ever, Old Mr. B, riddle me re, flower of England, fruit of Spain, met together in a shower of rain, put in a bag, tied round with a string. If you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a ring. Which was ridiculous of Nutkin, because he had not got any ring to give old Brown. The other squirrels hunted up and down the nut bushes, but Nutkin gathered Robin's pincushions off a briar bush and stuck them full of pine needle pins. On the fifth day, the squirrels brought a present of wild honey. It was so sweet and sticky that they licked their fingers as they put it down upon the stone. They had stolen it out of a bumblebee's nest on the tippity top of the hill. But Nutkin skipped up and down, singing, Hum a bum, buzz, buzz, hum a bum, buzz. As I went over Tippletine, I met a flock of bonny swine, some yellow naked, some yellow backed. They were the very bonniest swine that ever went over the Tippletine. Old Mr. Brown turned up his eyes in disgust at the impertinence of Nutkin, but he ate up the honey. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts, but Nutkin sat upon a big flat rock and played nine pins with a crab apple and green fir cones. On the sixth day, which was Saturday, The squirrels came again for the last time. They brought a new laid egg and a little rush basket as a last parting present for old Brown. But Nutkin ran in front laughing and shouting, Humpty Dumpty lies in the back with a white counterpane round his neck. Forty doctors and forty rights cannot put Humpty Dumpty to rights. Now, old Mr. Brown took an interest in eggs. He opened one eye and shut it again. But still, he did not speak. Nutkin became more and more impertinent. Old Mr. B, old Mr. B, Hickamore, Hackamore, on the king's kitchen door. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't drive Hickamore, Hackamore, 
off the king's kitchen door. Nutkin danced up and down like a sunbeam, but still Old Brown said nothing at all. Nutkin began again. Arthur O'Bower has broken his band. He comes roaring up the land. The King of Scots, with all his power, cannot turn Arthur of the bower. Nutkin made a whirring noise to sound like the wind, and he took a running jump right onto the head of Old Brown. Then all at once there was a flutterment and a scufflement and a loud squeak. The other squirrels scuttered away into the bushes. When they came back very cautiously, peeping round the tree, there was Old Brown sitting on his doorstep quite still, with his eyes closed, as if nothing had happened. But Nutkin was in his waistcoat pocket. This looks like the end of the story, but it isn't. Old Brown carried Nutkin into his house and held him up by the tail, intending to skin him. But Nutkin pulled so very hard that his tail broke in two, and he dashed up the staircase and escaped out of the attic window. And to this day, if you meet Nutkin up a tree and ask him a riddle, he will throw sticks at you and stamp his feet and scold and shout K-k-k-k-k-k-k. the tale of Benjamin Bunny. One morning, a little rabbit sat on a bank. He pricked his ears and listened to the trit trot trit trot of a pony. A gig was coming along the road. It was driven by Mr. McGregor, and beside him sat Mrs. McGregor in her best bonnet. As soon as they had passed, little Benjamin Bunny slipped down into the road and set off with a hop, skip, and a jump to call upon his relations who lived in the wood at the back of Mr. McGregor's garden. That wood was full of rabbit holes, and in the neatest, sandiest hole of all lived Benjamin's aunt and his cousins, Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. Old Mrs. Rabbit was a widow. She earned her living by knitting rabbit wool mittens and muffetees. I once bought a pair at a bazaar. She also sold herbs and rosemary tea and rabbit tobacco, which is what we call lavender. Little Benjamin did not very much want to see his aunt. He came round the back of the fir tree and nearly tumbled upon the top of his cousin Peter. Peter was sitting by himself. He looked poorly and was dressed in a red cotton pocket handkerchief. Peter, said little Benjamin in a whisper, Who has got your clothes? Peter replied, The scarecrow in Mr. McGregor's garden, and described how he had been chased about the garden 
and had dropped his shoes and coat. Little Benjamin sat down beside his cousin and assured him that Mr. McGregor had gone out on a gig and Mrs. McGregor also. And certainly for the day because she was wearing her best bonnet. Peter said he hoped that it would rain. At this point, old Mrs. Rabbit's voice was heard inside the rabbit hole, calling, Cottontail, Cottontail, fetch some more chamomile. Peter said he thought he might feel better if he went for a walk. They went away hand in hand and got upon the flat top of the wall at the bottom of the wood. From here they looked down into Mr. McGregor's garden. Peter's coat and shoes were plainly to be seen upon the scarecrow topped with an old tam-o'-shanter of Mr. McGregor's. Little Benjamin said, It spoils people's clothes to squeeze under a gate. The proper way to get in is to climb down a pear tree. Peter fell down head first, but it was of no consequence. As the bed below was newly raked and quite soft. It had been sewn with lettuces. They left a great many odd little footmarks all over the bed, especially little Benjamin, who was wearing clogs. Little Benjamin said, that the first thing to be done was to get back Peter's clothes in order that they might be able to use the pocket handkerchief. They took them off the scarecrow. There had been rain during the night. There was water in the shoes and the coat was somewhat shrunk Benjamin dried on the tam-o'-shanter, but it was too big for him. Then he suggested that they should fill the pocket handkerchief with onions as a little present for his aunt. Peter did not seem to be enjoying himself. He kept hearing noises. Benjamin, on the contrary, was perfectly at home and ate a lettuce leaf. He said that he was in the habit of coming to the garden with his father to get lettuces for their Sunday dinner. The name of little Benjamin's papa was old Mr. Benjamin Bunny. The lettuces certainly were very fine. Peter did not eat anything. He said he should like to go home. Presently, he dropped half the onions. Little Benjamin said that it was not possible to get back up the pear tree with a load of vegetables. He led the way boldly towards the other end of the garden. They went along a little walk on planks under a sunny red brick wall. The mice sat on their doorsteps, cracking cherry stones. They winked at Peter Rabbit and little Ben.
Benjamin.